and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the inaugural Sir George Reid Lecture. It's fantastic to see so many of you here tonight. A very special welcome to our guest lecturer, the Honourable Dr David Kemp. <laughs> Dr Kemp, thank you for agreeing to deliver the inaugural lecture and for the effort that you have gone to to put together for what I have no doubt will be an extremely insightful and pertinent lecture tonight. I would also like to welcome the member for Hawthorne and the Shadow Attorney General John Pesuto. Yeah. And member for Q and Parliamentary Secretary to the Leader of the Opposition, Tim Smith. Yeah. And welcome to members of the Administrative Committee, Fiona Ogilvie O'Donnell and Georgina Downer. Thank you for your continued support of the movement. And most importantly, welcome to all the young Liberals here tonight. This lecture series has been launched for you and the young Liberal movement to ensure that our generation and the generations to come never forget the values and principles that our great party was founded on in 1944. Modern day politics is fast paced and dominated by a 24 hour media cycle, social media, personality politics and gotcha moments. Sadly, real reform and courageous policy are rare. In addition to this, we are constantly told that young people are disengaged with politics, that youth apathy is at an all-time high. I'm often asked the question, why don't young people like the Liberal Party? Well, I fundamentally disagree with the premise of that question. I do not agree that young people are disinterested in the political process, although I do think relevancy is an issue. Sure. Politicians need to maintain a Facebook or Twitter account to engage youth votes. But social media, media is not a substitute for youth engagement. It must be policy focused. The values and principles that our party was founded on are as relevant today as they were in 1944. These timeless beliefs provide our party with a unique policy narrative that can be made relevant to every generation. We are the party of lower taxation of less regulation, of smaller government and less government interference in people's lives. These principles are as relevant to young people today as they were in the Menzies government, the Fraser government and the Howard government. And they are the reason that we joined the Liberal Party. In speaking to the young Liberal movement in 1960, Sir Robert Menzies spoke about the formation of the Liberal Party and being elected to government in 1949. He made the point that it all happened because we have something to believe in. Not just something to oppose, but something to believe in. Sir Robert was a big supporter of the Young Liberal Movement. He saw our movement as the future of the party, the political minds and leaders of tomorrow. But he warned that we must constantly ask, what is it we believe in? To ensure that politics is not just the attainment and preservation of power, but rather the improve improvement of society. In the words of Sir Robert, modern history, as you all know, is full of examples of great movements that disappeared because they have ceased to have any genuine reason for existence. It isn't enough just to accommodate the structure of new things or new events. The important thing is to have faith to live by, and that goes for us in our party. If liberalism stands for anything, and young liberalism above all, it's for a passion to contribute to the nation to be free, but to be contributors, to submit to the discipline of demand instead of the ordinary dull discipline of regimented mass of people. He warned that unless we carry this torch on, as he believed we would, he would turn in his grave and reprove us. The Sir George Reid Lecture will do as Sir Robert suggests. It will ask us, what is it we believe in? So as the next generation of leaders in our party, we will proudly, and proudly promote and defend our Liberal values. Now let me properly introduce our lecturer, Dr Kemp. The Honourable Dr David Kemp is a Fellow of the Australian New Zealand School of Government and a board member of the Grattan Institute. 
He was a professor and vice chancellor's fellow at the University of Melbourne from 2005 to 2010. And prior to his political career, was a senior lecturer in political science at the University of Melbourne and professor of politics at Monash University. Dr. Kemp graduated with law and arts degrees from the University of Melbourne, winning the Urn Exhibition in Jurisprudence and the Giles Turner Prize in Australian History. He was a Fulbright Scholar in 1968 to 1971, attending Yale University, where he completed a PhD with distinction. He is best known in the academic world for his work on voting behaviour and for his studies showing the decline of class-based voting and the rise of values-based politics. Dr Kemp was a member of the House of Representatives, representing the Victorian seat of Goldstein from 1990 to 2004. He was a cabinet minister in the Howard government and held a number of portfolios in the areas of education, employment, training, youth affairs, environment and heritage. He was vice president of the executive council from 1998 to 2004 and a member of the expenditure review committee in the third Howard government. Dr Kemp was state president of the Victorian division from 2007 to 2011 and is widely renowned as the Liberal Party's unofficial historian, publishing books such as The Forgotten People and Other Studies in Democracy. Dr Kemp, I invite you to deliver the inaugural Sir George Reid Lecture, entitled George Reid, Champion of Liberalism. Yes, thank you very much for asking me to deliver this lecture. Uh, it's a lecture that obviously concerns a man who predates the modern Liberal Party and takes us back to the Federation era. And I was particularly pleased to be asked to do this because the roots of Liberalism extend much deeper than 1944. Australian liberalism is in fact a political philosophy which more than any other has determined the character of Australia as a country. And indeed the very nation of Australia is the creation of Australian liberalism. And we do ourselves an injustice if we talk as if our history only goes back to the second last year of the Second World War. Our history goes right back to the formation of modern Australia. Now George Reid falls in the middle of that period and what makes George Reid stand out is that in many ways he was similar to Sir Robert Menzies in that he claimed to have an explicit political philosophy which he attempted to carry out through his political career. And so when we look at Reid's life and times and career, we're invited to ask ourselves, well, what is the role of a philosophy? Does it matter? And what can it help us do? What happens if we don't have a philosophy? So this is a lecture really about the role of ideas in politics. All of us interested in politics, and especially those who are thinking about a political career, need to decide what kind of participant in politics do we want to be and what kind of politician do we want to be. And George Reid's career forces us to think about this because in the course of his career, apart from his general political philosophy, he was, of course, the great advocate of freedom of trade. And George Reid lost that debate, though he was regarded as one of the best platform speakers in the whole of the British Empire. He was famous around the world for his skills. Nevertheless, as we know, Australia plunged into protectionism and ended up in the Great Depression with collapsed industries and one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. 
But George Reed's experience invites us to ask, is it better to be right as a politician or better to be on the winning side of an argument? Is it better to be judged by the opinion of the day or is it the judgment of history that matters? It'd be nice to have both, of course. But choices have to be made and George Reid knew what was happening and made choices. More about that later. In the judgment of history, he stands tall because he was ultimately proved to be right. Protectionism was one of the causes of the Second World War and since the Second World War, nations around the world Clear, and both sides of Australian politics have, I think, broadly, not without a lot of cavilling along the way, but broadly accepted the fact that free trade is the correct policy. But it do, the correct policy doesn't always win. So there's no getting away from the importance of ideas in politics. If you don't have your own ideas, the ideas you'll be acting on will be someone else's ideas. If you don't have your own ideas, you risk just becoming the pawn of the political correctness or the conventional wisdom of the day. If you don't have your own ideas, you're likely to find yourself at the mercy of prejudices, other people's prejudices or your own prejudices. You're likely to find yourself carrying out policies that are based on nothing more than unsubstantiated opinion. And the enormous treasure I think we have in the Liberal Party is that we have a philosophy with a very long history which tells us some basic truths about political life and about society and the way it works and how in the end you achieve a community that's got a very high level of happiness. Now, I thought I'd put right at the start of this talk this statement by Menzies, because Menzies made the point that the art of politics is really about ideas and about conveying ideas to others and, if possible, persuading a majority to agree or to encourage a public opinion which is so soundly based that it endures and is not blown aside by chance winds to persuade people to take long-range views. Now, Reid is a fascinating character to look at because Reid was torn, you could see throughout his whole political career, by the tension between standing on principle and acting in terms of the short-term requirements of the politics of the day. Overwhelmingly, Reid stuck to principle. But he spent much of his time fighting against utopian, politically correct, fallacious policy ideas which he believed would damage the mass of the people and damage Australia. He was a very practical, he was a very brilliant politician. In fact, Alfred Deakin, his main opponent in the federal sphere, was nervous about Reid's political brilliance. But he was often criticised by friends and foes for compromising for political advantage. And he didn't do it often, and that was the sort of thing that maybe John Howard did from time to time as well. Two steps forward, one step back. The one step back can cost you dearly, even if you have moved the whole political debate forward. But Reid didn't hesitate to do it because he tried as best he could to be effective. So Reid was like Menzies. He believed in a politics of principle rather than in a politics which was driven by lobby groups and powerful pressures. 
If Robert Menzies is the principal founder of the Liberal Party, then probably Reid, with a bit of a stretch, could be thought of uh, as the grandfather of the Liberal Party. For Menzies inherited from Reid many of the elements of a policy and political agenda that he used to transform Australia into one of the most successful countries in the world. Menzies was 10 years old when Reid was Prime Minister. And in many ways, of course, he had faced a political situation which had deteriorated greatly since Reid's time. And indeed, it was the outcome of the battles that Reid fought that actually defined a lot of the problem, particularly the problem of socialism and communism in the unions and in national policy leading to the nationalisation of the banks under the attempt to nationalise the banks under Chifley. That came out of the very battles that Reid had first defined and attempted to win. Now, I said Reid was a, a great speaker and won most of the debates that he was involved in. He was a very rotund man, as you can see from that <laughs> official painting. He was eloquent, he was highly intelligent, he was a big-hearted man with a sparkling platform wit. And mostly people didn't comment on his figure, uh, but in one incident there was a heckler who pointed to his paunch sticking out in front of him on the platform and said, what are you going to call it, George? <laughs> to which Reid replied, if it's a boy, I'll call it after myself. If it's a girl, I'll call it Victoria. But if, as I strongly suspect, it's nothing but piss and wind, I'll name it after you. <laughs> Now, Reid's sparkling wit made him a very popular speaker. And in the days before microphones and amplifying systems in big halls, it was nothing for Reid to address a couple of thousand people in a town hall or uh, in the exhibition building or somewhere. The crowds flocked to hear him. But before I talk a little bit more about this, I just want to flash up his CV to make sure that we've all got a common understanding of who Reid was. He was born in 1845 in Scotland, came with his parents to Australia in 1852, educated at Scotch College, trained as a barrister for a number of years. Uh, at age 13, he became a junior clerk. At age 19, he was an assistant accountant in the colonial treasury. He discovered a skill in debating at the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts, was secretary of the Young Men's Presbyterian Union, and in his work built up a good reputation, becoming a clerk, which was a senior position then in the public service at the age of 29. He was already writing pamphlets on politics and engaging in political debates. He was the model of a young liberal trying to get his case across. He worked very hard at it. He was a child of 19th century liberalism, as represented by the British Liberal Party and which was led through several successful elections by William Ewart Gladstone. Unlike Menzies, Reid grew up in an era when liberal ideas provided the dominant principles on which public policy was based. The 19th century was a great liberal time. The idea that society based on individual liberty was the road to human advancement and economic progress was widely accepted. Freedom of speech and the press, freedom of religion, freedom to establish businesses and sell goods, freedom to trade were the conventional wisdom of the age. The central value of the age was the importance of individual liberty. Under policies of economic freedom, Australia had become, in the second half of the 19th century, probably the wealthiest country in the world, certainly on a per capita basis. Churches had flourished, the free press was taken for granted and acknowledged as one of very high quality. Liberty under the rule of law was protected by sovereign parliaments and independent courts. 
universal primary education had been established, democratic representative government. By 1880s, Liberal parties of that name had been formed across the eastern colonies in Australia. And their aim was to protect liberty and advance reform. The dominant thinkers, the sort of intellectual fathers, if you like, both of that liberalism and Reed's liberalism, were people such as John Stuart Mill and Herbert Spencer. Mill was the main figure fighting against the political correctness of the day. And if you want to read a case against political correctness and how to deal with it, Mill's essay on liberty remains must reading. Mill argued for unpopular ideas such as equal rights for men and women, freedom of speech to say unpopular things, even unchristian things. And he saw the need to correct the extraordinary maldistribution of wealth and income in England, which he said had never been based on the principles on which private property should be based, which is that people have earned their income and their wealth through their efforts he thought that the distribution of wealth in England was a result of force and violence over hundreds of years and couldn't be justified. Herbert Spencer was the libertarian of the age, where Mill had faith that democratic government could reform and make society better. Spencer thought government was corrupt, inefficient, ignorant and was likely to make things worse if it interfered. He was the father of laissez-faire. Reed wasn't a supporter of laissez-faire. He was more close to Mill than he was to Spencer. But some of the prominent Liberals in Reed's party saw Spencer as their Aristotle, and we'll come to one of them a little bit later. Now, the political campaign that had the most effect on Reed was a campaign that occurred at the time of his death in England, the campaign of the Anti-Corn Law League, which was successful in 1846 in abolishing the Corn Laws. Now, what was wrong with the Corn Laws? The Corn Laws imposed a tariff on imported wheat. They raised prices for the poor. And the fight for free trade was a fight to improve the condition of the poor. It was the central policy of the British Liberal Party in Gladstone. And it gave 19th century liberalism a moral stature because the protectionists in Britain were the conservatives who wanted to shield their economic enterprises from international competition. And the Liberals in Australia and Britain would have nothing to do with that. Which is why something very sad happened to Australian Liberalism in Victoria, which I'll come to in a moment. But before I do that, I'll just mention that the great heroes of this campaign, the campaign against the Corn Laws, were John Bright and Richard Cobden. And Cobden developed free trade into a whole political philosophy about peace in the world. Because trade was voluntary, not regulated by government, because it made people better off and improved the condition of the poor, it removed one of the main causes of war, which was the need to fight a country to get access to its markets. And so the doctrine of free trade became not only a morally sound policy, but a policy of international peace. Now, young George Reed, in this terrific bowler hat, very keen supporter of free trade, wrote five free trade essays which won, as a young man, which won him the Cobden Prize in England and made him an honorary member of the Cobden Club. 
and they were a powerful defence of free trade and showed the intellectual stature of Reid at a young age. Free trade stood for him as the philosophy of his political life. Now, Reid's strong belief made him the sworn enemy of this man. This man is David Syme, the founder and editor of The Age, an anti-English Scot who became a fanatical supporter of the idea of building up local industry by shielding it from international competition. Some of Syme's supporters even wanted to prohibit trade altogether. Before prohibition meant prohibition of alcohol, there were people in Victorian politics who used the word prohibition to mean prohibition of trade. And Syme, under the influence of a very few protectionist economists overseas, argued that if Australia was ever going to be a nation with its own industry, it would have to protect that industry. And he argued what has proven to be one of the great fallacies of protection, that it was a way of creating jobs. Now, Reid never hesitated to point out that in free trade New South Wales, there were just as many industries and just as many jobs, and they were jobs that were competitive with whatever trade was coming into the country. But this division split Australian liberalism in the 19th century. Victoria was protectionist and New South Wales under Henry Parks and then very much so under George Reid was free trade. And both of them claimed the title of liberalism. Syme and the young journalist of the age that he managed to persuade, Alfred Deakin, said that liberalism was protectionist. But Reid always argued that liberalism at its very roots and philosophically because of its belief in individual liberty and commercial liberty had to be free trade. Reid used to love coming to Victoria and when he did so, of course, he would attack The Age. The Age was a newspaper, he used to say, where the protectionists were upstairs in the editorial room but the free traders were downstairs in the purchasing department. And he took particular advantage of one occasion when The Age had announced that it would only use newsprint created in Victoria but then backtracked on the policy. And Reid said the gentleman downstairs saw that he had been deceived by the gentleman upstairs. To a meeting of over 2,000 people in the Adelaide Town Hall in October 1900, Reid talked about the infant industries of protection. He said the peculiarity about these industrial infants was that the older they got, the more nourishment they required. He would like to know how even a state mother could keep up under those circumstances. Protectionists ask, said Reid, can you point out a nation that has ever grown great without having a protectionist policy? And Reid said, I say in reply, is there one family that has ever grown old without having the measles? Reid saw science protectionism as just an attempt to buttress some businesses at the expense of others. It was discriminatory, it wasn't going to make those industries efficient and in the end, of course, it did destroy the international competitiveness of Australian manufacturing and it meant higher prices for lower income people. Reid also argued that free trade made businesses efficient and competitive and indeed one of the favourites of cartoonists at the time was Reid's dog because Reid had said, it's not cruelty to chuck a puppy into the water and teach him to swim. It's not cruelty to let young industries work and grow by their own efforts. Now, this happens to be a bulletin cartoon in which 
the cartoonists are suggesting that Reed wasn't entirely consistent there and was sheltering one of these puppies under his umbrella, which presumably was implying that Reed had backtracked on some aspect of free trade. But the fact is, Reed, in the end, put his whole career on the line for free trade. Now, I want to now talk about a couple of other intellectual influences at the time that Reed had to cope with. One was Henry George. These days, Henry George is just regarded as a sort of a one of the follies, intellectual follies of the, the 19th century. But Henry George actually put forward a very good idea. And that was that if you were going to tax land, you should tax the unimproved value of land, as local councils do today, because the unimproved value reflects the value of the land that's created by society as a whole and not by the person owning the land. Henry George wrote a famous book called Progress and Poverty in which he argued that the reason why people in American cities, and he was an American, American cities were poor despite the fact that America was increasingly wealthy was because the recurrence of land booms gave the landholders the ability to cream off the surplus into their own pockets instead of allowing it to flow through into the wages of workers. Now, as it happened, Henry George was particularly interested in Australia and, of course, Australia had a land boom in the 1880s and it collapsed in 1890. And in, 19, in 1890, Henry George came to Australia and addressed 4,000 people in the exhibition building, arguing that Australia would be better off if it got rid of customs duties and had a land tax. And Reed's Liberal Party filled up with supporters of Henry George. And that was a political problem for him because although he agreed that free trade meant you had to get rid of customs duties and therefore you had to find another source of revenue for government, he didn't like the land tax. And Reed became a supporter of direct taxation on the wealthy and made it a part of his program to introduce income tax so that the wealthy paid their fair share. It was the GST debate of the day because customs duties was an indirect tax on the goods that the lower income people depended on. So if you got rid of customs duties, you had free trade, you had to get your revenue from somewhere, why not have an income tax that was a fair income tax across the community? Surely, he said, in a country that called itself democratic, if a new taxation was wanted, the time had come to fairly face the strong financial interests of the country and put some of the burdens on the backs of some of the strongest people. It was, of course, a populist argument. It was also a practical argument. The second person that influenced Reid and influenced Australia was Edward Bellamy. And Bellamy published a romantic science fiction novel called Looking Backward, 2000 to 1887. And everyone read it. Hundreds of trade unionists read it. Every prime minister that I can find at the time read it, except so far I've never been able to establish whether Reid read it. But Bellamy was the source of some of the worst ideas in Australian politics before the Greens. Be Be <laughs> Bellamy proposed utterly utopian ideas that had no prospect of being successful or adopted, but were widely accepted at the time. So far as Reid was concerned, he had fought for liberal unity and for a liberal philosophy that the party could stand on. And ultimately, of course, Deakin realised that he couldn't work with Labor because Labor was trying to destroy him in the electorate. And Labor was winning the protectionist seats, which was why the protectionist representation was falling. And so finally, the two sides of liberalism, the protectionist and the free trade, came together in the liberal fusion. This is a picture of Joseph Cook, who 
had become the leader of the, the Free Trade Liberal Party when Reid, at that time, just before this fusion, stepped down with Deakin, who would become the leader of the first united Liberal government in Australia. What was Reid's attitude to this? He was exultant. He'd grown tired of the constant refrain that the protectionists were the true Liberals. Liberalism, he said, was not invented in Victoria. Liberalism in Australia is the child of the great liberalism of the mother country and the child of liberalism throughout the nations. One of the points about this fusion which recommends it most strongly to me is that for the future the term liberal in Australian politics will have a broader meaning and a more generous sound. That this consolidation of liberal forces will, I hope and believe, work effectively in our future political life. There is no man in Australia who ought to be prouder of liberal unity than I should be since I laid its foundations in the battle I fought before the electors three years ago. Reid went on to become Australia's first High Commissioner to Britain. For two years, between 1916 and 1918, he served in the House of Commons. As the First World War entered its final days, Reid died in London of cerebral thrombosis on the 13th of September 1918. He was buried in Putney Vale Cemetery following a service in St Columbus Church of Scotland. Hughes, Cook and Fisher attended the service along with the representatives, the Allies and the Japanese ambassador. So if you go to London and you want to visit and pay your respects to George Reid, you can go to Putney Vale Cemetery and there he lies. But the cause for which he fought didn't die. Joseph Cook, who had left the Labor Party because of Reid and became one of Reid's main political organisers and then succeeded Reid to the leadership of the Free Trade Party, told a meeting of the Liberal Speakers Association just after he became Prime Minister in 1913. And that was the young Liberal movement of the day. So this is Cook talking to the young Liberals in 1913. There will yet be in Australia, I believe, shall I say I hope, a fight which will range these two principles, liberalism and socialism, up to an issue simple, which will enable us to throw everything into the scale. It must come sooner or later, this square stand-up fight with the principles of socialism. There can be no compromise between these two contending principles. They are as diametrically opposed as light and darkness. One means slavery economically and socially to the individual. The other means the fullest and largest liberty. There is as much difference between them as right and wrong. Now, as we know, that fantasy gathered force in the Labor Party and in the Labor movement right through the 20s and 30s, and in 1931, Jack Lang, leader of the Labor Party in New South Wales, proposed the socialisation of all industry in that state. And during those decades, the Communist Party sought to disrupt Australian economic development, already struggling under the burden of protection, and during the war sought to undermine the provisioning of Australian troops. I think it's true to say that no English-speaking country no English-speaking country experienced such a strong attempt at socialisation as Australia. And as we know, it would be Robert Menzies who would eventually confront the issue and beat Australia, beat socialism in Australia politically and intellectually and set Australia back on a liberal course. But in doing so, he was following on from the extraordinary intellectual and political work that Reid had carried out. Reid, to finish up with, sounds a bit like Menzies in the statement. The future of humanity in Australia lies not in curtailing its freedom, nor restricting its freedom, nor limiting its opportunity but allowing the genius for competition, for excelling, for acquiring, to reach its utmost altitude, 
consistent with the rights of others. So it's appropriate in these days when liberalism is under challenge once again from political correctness and the constant efforts of government to interfere in every aspect of life to honour the memory, the example and the political courage of George Root. Thank you. Dr Kemp, thank you on behalf of all of us here tonight um, for that magnificent lecture. Um, I'm quite a fan of uh, George Reid. He's the only Prime Minister to have attended the school that both you and I attended. Um, and um, I have always been um, surprised that the Victorian history of our great movement is so pocketed with the scourge of protectionism which took, frankly, uh, until the new right in the 1980s to properly expunge from the philosophical tradition in our state. That's long gone, uh, but it's something uh, that I think we should all be cognizant of, the debates between free traders and protectionists at the time of federation. Last week um, saw um, an obscure anniversary, 27th, the 24th of March, rather, was the last day in 1927 where the Federal Parliament sat in Melbourne. So um, as John and I go about our business in the State Parliament, um, you are reminded constantly of the great debates of Federation uh, that Reid himself was a part of and how he stood against the tide that put an economic noose around our country's neck for 80 years, that of centralised wage fixing, white Australia and high tariffs, which he largely stood against. Um, and it's why I felt that your speech tonight uh, was so poignant, because here was a man who served in three different parliaments, at least the Assembly of New South Wales, the House of Representatives, the House of Commons, was our first High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, um, a Prime Minister for a short period of time, but Premier of New South Wales for quite a period of time, who did the right thing when at the time it was probably not his immediate political interest to do so. And I think that's a lesson for me as the youngest Liberal MP in State Parliament, as John is doing, for John is doing an outstanding job as our Shadow Attorney General, and for everyone else here who is aspiring for public office, uh, that in the end you are remembered more fondly for doing the right thing uh, than doing the most politically expedient thing. So Dr Kemp, if you would like to come forward and in good Presbyterian manner accept a bottle of wine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and thank you again, Dr Kemp, for that outstanding lecture. Uh, that concludes the formalities for this evening, but we'll be serving drinks at the back of the room, so please join us.